of the behavior. Um, Sass and others have said that behaviorism is reductionistic and dehumanizes man. As I've pointed out, it dehomunculizes man. If, there's a, if you believe that the body is steered and run by a little man inside, then behaviorism gets rid of that little man. The body is run by its own structure, the genetic endowment of the species, and its history in contact with the environment and the current environment. I think that that is compatible with the most noble view of, of human nature. I see no, no dehumanizing about it. Uh, the thing that bothers me about these references to behaviorism as being manipulative, and another question brought that up, is this. Um, Chomsky and others have repeatedly said that behaviorism is associated with manipulative political philosophies, by which he means, I suppose, fascism. Um, and as a matter of fact, uh, I have been called fascist, but I, nothing in my, anything that I've ever done is in the slightest, in the slightest extent similar to what has happened under what I would call fascist governments. The issue is this. If you, if you think that human behavior is determined primarily by genetic programming, and this is what you mean when you talk about the development of human behavior. Shakespeare had seven ages. Eric Erickson has 10. Freud had different ones depending upon when you look at Freud's work and so on. But there are the things are growing in the individual. You're born with the, knowledge, with the knowledge of grammar, according to Chomsky and so on. You know the rules of grammar. Uh, if you think that we develop in the sense of grow, like an embryo. And Chomsky is, has said, Roger Brown has said, that the development of language is like embryonic growth. Then you're at one end of the continuum. At the other end, you say that behavior is due to what happens during the lifetime of the individual. You don't deny that you start with an organism, and that is genetic. But it is pliable, manipulable, you can change it. Then uh, quite clearly, in that case, uh, manipulation is at the end of the environmental con end of the continuum. Because you can change the environment, you can't change a genetic endowment except very slowly through some kind of genetic program. And nobody pays much attention to eugenics these days or any kind of effort. You can't make people speak grammatically by breeding people with better innate gra grammar. You know, don't work that way. If you want to teach people to be grammatical, you teach better grammar in schools. Well. If those are the two ends, then you ask which is going to be the one politically most associated with, let's say, vicious political practices. Well, I submit that if you know how to change the environment and are concerned with things like education, therapy, and so on, you will use those ways to bring about the kinds of changes that are important. If you, on the other hand, don't. If you believe this thing is all born into you, then you can't change in any reasonable way at all, and you turn into the most violent ways. The person who really believed in the genetic programming of behavior in the 20th century was Adolf Hitler. That's racism. And Chomsky is absolutely 180 degrees wrong about this. It isn't that racism follows that it isn't that the concentration camp follows from a theory of innate behavior. It is that when you believe that behavior is innate, you can't think of anything else to do but a final solution which involves a concentration camp. When you are concerned about changing behavior and can do so, then you don't turn to the vicious methods. You turn to better schools, better forms of therapy, better incentive systems, better rehabilitation programs, and so on. So I would say just the opposite from Chomsky, that, that a, a good practical behavior modification makes it possible to be humane in dealing with people, whereas the genetic approach leaves you open to nothing but violence. Um, I'm sure that my so-called friend, Dr. Thomas Sass, would not agree with that. Uh, 
he uh, is a is the ultimate in a rightist, uh, but also, curiously enough, would believe in the individual as determining his own behavior. Well, that is a form of genetic determination, of course. Um, well, I, I don't know whether I should try to to um, probe these anymore. But could I just throw it open to the uh, to the audience to? If you if you've asked a question I haven't answered, please uh, bring it up. <coughs> yes. Uh, Dr. What is, in your opinion, the concept of will and comment about the concept of will in your psychology? Yes, uh, the concept of will is a question. What is the concept of will? Um, uh, you associate voluntary behavior with, with what I would call operant behavior. It's a distinction between reflex behavior uh, and, um, and voluntary behavior between the autonomic nervous system, unless we talk about recent discoveries and the modification of that through voluntary action and so on, plus uh, as against the skeletal and so on. What is, is, is will? Well, now, operant behavior or behavior which is determined by its consequences has no immediately preceding cause. A reflex has. It's a stimulus and a response. So you would you attribute the response to the stimulus. But when you just suddenly pop out with a remark or uh, action, you suddenly go for a walk, there was nothing there that triggered that. And so you feel that you must have done it as an act of will. That there must have been some inner initiating act, a creative act, if you like. That is always the problem when you're dealing with selection by consequences. And it is precisely the problem that Darwin faced in The Origin of Species. The crucial word in that title is origin, origin, the beginnings of something. How can you deal with the beginnings of the species? Well, you, an act of creation is one way to do it. But by selection, there is no prior act, you see. And then for a long time, though, people tried to talk about creative evolution, as even so, there must have been some design in it. But now the, the biochemists and others have got that all figured out, and there is no prior act of will in the, in the development of, this, of the human species. And similarly, if you accept the view of operant conditioning, there is no prior act of will in determining operant behavior. Um, it's just you don't need the concept. Uh, the behavior occurs depending upon states of deprivation and histories of reinforcement under comparable circumstances. The circumstances are never, never, they're compelled, they're not, they're predisposing but not compelling. Yes. 